From NPR and WBEZ Chicago, this is Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, the NPR News Quiz. I'm Carl Castle, and here's your host at the Thomas Wolfe Auditorium at U.S. Cellular Center, Asheville in North Carolina, Peter Sagal. show for you today. Later on, we'll be talking to Charles Frazier, author of Cold Mountain and other books you've lied and said you read. But first, can I say what a pleasure to be back in Asheville, North Carolina, home of artists, home of artists and musicians and brewers, gateway to the Smokies, and of course, according to a state legislator, a cesspool of sin. I've got to ask you, a proud son of North Carolina, a Tar Heel, you've been away for a long time. Do you feel any different when you come back? Not even a June bug smidgen, Petey Joe. Well, I'm as comfy as gravy on a biscuit, y'all. <laughs> well, we're all down home this week, so give us a call. The number is one wait 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 That's one 888 It's time to welcome our first listener contestant. Hi, you're on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. Hi, this is David Schwartz from East Norwalk, Connecticut. That's terrific, David. Welcome to our show. What do you do there in uh, East Norwalk? Uh, actually, I'm an attorney in New York City. Really? Yeah. Surprise, surprise. So you just you just say you just say you're from. You have Please, a... David. You have so many fans here in Asheville. You have no <laughs> idea. All right, David, great to have you with us. Let me introduce you to our panel this week. First up, a comedian and a host at Vocalo.org. Mr. Brian Babylon is here. Yes. Hey, David. Thank you so much. Hey, Dave. Next, say hello to one of the women behind the Washington Post's reliable source column, Ms. Roxanne Roberts. Hey, Dave. Also a comedian performing August 9th through the 11th at Zany's in Nashville, Tennessee. I am? It's Bobcat Goldthwait. Well, hello. Hi, David. Did, did nobody tell you, Bobcat, that you're going to be in Nashville? I'm on a need-to-know basis. I understand. It's like the black ops. They huh? just sent me out. So, David, uh, so you're a police officer? Was that what it <laughs> Attorney. Even attorney. Worse. Attorney. Okay. I don't know why I thought. I don't know why I thought cop. Oh, because uh, all these hippies groaned. That's why. Oh, they're all mad at me now. Really, Asheville? Please. I drove by a place called the Organic Mechanic today, and you're gonna. I I have no idea. Maybe what is it? Is well, it, basically, they don't want to. They don't want to compel the lug nuts to come off. They try to convince them to <laughs> by rapping with them. David, you're going to start us off with Who's Carl this time? Carl Castle is going to read you three quotes from the week's news. Your job, correctly identify or explain just two of them. Do that. You will win our prize. Carl's voice on your home answering machine voicemail, whatever you got there. You ready to go? Oh, yeah. I'm glad to have Carl back. Oh, we all are. Believe me. All right. Here is your first quote. He had the will and the bravery to go against the matrix. That was a Russian legislator celebrating Russia's decision to grant asylum to whom? Uh, Edward Snowden. Exactly right, Edward Snowden. On Thursday, much to the surprise of everybody, international jet setter and fugitive Edward Snowden walked out of the Moscow airport where he's been living for the past month or so. He's been surviving on nothing but Cinnabons and duty-free spiced rum. He seemed fine, except for weighing 400 pounds and reflexively searching for a seat near an electrical outlet. And you know what no one's mentioning? What? He had to smell bad. <laughs> that's, that's what I've been thinking this whole time. I mean, you know, like, airport bathroom yeah, wash-ups yeah. can only go so far. That's right. We need to, like, immerse yourself into a... He needs an immersion. Yeah. Like, with some type of, like, Febreze or something... <laughs> Now, Snowden was granted a temporary asylum in Russia after someone didn't understand it was a rhetorical question when he asked, what could be worse than living in an airport? <laughs> Very good, David. Here is your next quote. Who am I to judge? That was somebody saying he had no right to condemn gay people, which made the news, because the person saying it is, in fact, whom? Uh, the Pope. The Pope Francis. Very good. This week, 
In an impromptu news conference on his airplane, known as Pope Force One, Pope Francis shocked everybody by saying of gays, who am I to judge? And the world responded, you're the Pope. That's why you get to wear the white hat. You judge people. That's what you do. So Pope Francis doesn't sleep in the papal apartments. He carries his own bags, and now he will not condemn gay people. It's time to seriously ask the question, is the Pope Catholic? (laughs) Somewhere a bear is going, what am I doing here in the woods? This is unsanitary. (laughs) What he said was something that affected is that people ask him about gay people. He says, well, you know, there's gay people, but, you know, as long as they're well-intentioned and seek God and seek to be good people, who am I to judge them, Right. And immediately, the Vatican, you know, officials started to walk it back. They're like, well, you know, what he meant by being well-intentioned is like, do they intend to find a nice girl and settle down? That's what he means. Man, he's, he's like the old dirty, old dirty bastard of popes, man. He does whatever he wants to do, Wu-Tang. No, the, 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 he's a, he's a, he can go a little too far in this sort of progressive thing. Apparently, the way you now get rosary beads is by lifting your shirt and they throw you some. <laughs> a little too far. David, here we go. Here is your last quote. I want to be a role model. That was New York Yankee Alex Rodriguez, who may be facing a lifetime ban from baseball due to what? Uh, Taking steroids? Yes, indeed. Performance-enhancing drugs. Major League Baseball has threatened Alex Rodriguez with a lifetime suspension from the game, partly because he took performance-enhancing drugs, partly because he lied about it, and partly because, man, what a putz. This is the most unsurprising revelation about an athlete ever. Like, remember Saint Ain't Sojo? You know, the little kid, the disbelieving kid in the courthouse steps? A-Rod's going to come outside to meet an adorable little boy, and the kid's going to look up and say, Figures, you ass. <laughs> now, what, what, what was this he was doing? A cream, or was it injections? I mean, what are these guys? Oh, he was doing everything. He was, A-Rod? Yeah, A-Rod. Well, apparently, apparently he, was, he, was, he was both implicated in the biogenesis scandal. This was this longevity center in uh, Florida that was giving out all this stuff to athletes. And that has nothing to do with Star Trek II Wrath of Khan. That's just <laughs> Genesis. No, it's just, Project. Yeah, yeah, okay. no, get confused. My bad. All right. It's okay. What's amazing is, is how much the other players seem to hate him. He, he, so even other Yankees hate him. Lance Armstrong just threw away his A-Rod <laughs> jersey. Can I ask you a kind of off, a kind of a crazy question? Go ahead. Whatever. Do you think if A-Rod looked like Steve Buscemi, people would give him a hard time? <laughs> are you I mean, saying, I are you this, saying this, people this are just theoretical. jealous of his good looks? I think a little no, bit. Are I you think, saying the same body and Buscemi's head? No, if, if, if it, yeah, like... Because I'm trying to imagine this. Yeah, muscles, athletic prowess, but just that mug. <laughs> Do you think people would have such... You're telling me we hate him because he's beautiful. I'm not saying anything. This is a hypothetical. <laughs> well, Derek Jeter is a pretty good-looking fellow. Plays the same team. Everybody loves him. He's no A-Rod. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> oh, that's what polls say. I don't know. I just read the paper, man. Right. <laughs> Brian has a type. <laughs> but that, didn't, didn't he, like, not fail a drug test yet? How do you do that? How do you do drugs and not get caught? Well, that's what Lance Armstrong did. It's possible. It can be done, and apparently he did it. No, but seriously, how do you do it? How do you do it? <laughs> I, I, I know there's someone in this room who has a job interview to go to yeah. and, no, and needs to know that. No, seriously, yeah. What, 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 no. What? Myself in Asheville wants to know. No. <laughs> Carl, how did David do in our quiz? David, you had three correct answers, so you win our prize. Yay! Yeah. We want to remind everyone they can join us most weeks back at the Chase Bank Auditorium in Chicago, Illinois. For tickets and more information, go to wbez.org, and you can find a link at our website, waitwait.npr.org. Right now, panel, time for you to answer some questions about this week's news. Brian, our oranges are in danger. A citrus virus is threatening to destroy them. According to the New York Times, though, scientists are working to create a new genetically modified orange plant that will include DNA from what? All right, I... I think I know this. Can you give me a slight hint? Well, the O in OJ will stand for oink. 
Oh, it's going to give pig DNA because bugs hate that. Exactly right. Pigs is the answer. Something called citrus greening, which is not a beauty treatment they offer at a spa here in Asheville, but a disease is wiping out orange crops all over the world. If no cure is found, oranges will go extinct, more or less. And the rest of us will be forced to drink tomato juice for breakfast and to find some other word to use to describe John Boehner's skin color. <laughs> but, 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 oranges will be to the next level because they'll taste like bacon. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> well, this is if this works. You know? this, is, this is if this works. Uh, citrus growers are trying something daring. They're going to design a new orange plant from the DNA up hoping to engineer resistance to the disease. So this orange juice is not kosher? <laughs> no, presumably not. Well, that's an interesting question. Whoa. From NPR and WBEZ Chicago, this is Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, the NPR News Quiz. I'm Carl Castle. We're playing this week with Bobcat Goldthwait, Roxanne Roberts, and Brian Babylon. And here again is your host at U.S. Cellular Center Asheville in North Carolina, Peter Sagal. Thank you, Carl. Thank you all. Right now, it's time for the Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, Bluff the Listener Game. Call one triple eight wait wait to play our game in the air. Hi, you're on wait wait. Don't tell me. Hi, I'm Ed Goodman from Pompano Beach, Florida. Hey, Ed, what do you do there in Florida? I'm a pilot. Are you? Uh, do you like fly for the big airlines? What do you do? No, I'm a corporate pilot, and I work for a fractional provider, so uh, I fly a lot of executives around and stuff. Oh, I see. So this is like the thing where you can buy a fraction of an airplane. <laughs> yeah, I had you in mind. <laughs> Take the wing. Yeah, the wings. <laughs> You want the part that flies. Yeah, you want the solid part. Yeah, that's important. Well, welcome to our show, Ed. You're going to play the game in which you must try to tell truth from fiction. Carl, what is Ed's topic? Get your nose out of that book. Books. They're great for reading or for making a little stand for your iPad, but not necessarily for imitating. This week, our panelists are going to read you three stories of people getting into trouble copying something they read in a book. Guess the real-life literary disaster, and you will win Carl's voice in your home answering machine or voicemail. Ready to play? I am. First, let's hear from Bobcat Goldthwait. It's been two years since the last Harry Potter movie was released and well over four since the last novel was published, but that hasn't slowed down the rash of Harry Potter-inspired injuries in the UK. It seems that whenever the wildly popular J.K. Rowling books are discovered by a new generation, Britain's ERs become packed with Potter-related injuries, such as burns from jumping into fireplaces to teleport, groin splinters from broomsticks, along with bone fractures from leaping from roofs attempting to play Kidditch. In the past two years, over 14 children have been treated for concussions after running into the seventh and eighth pillar at the train stations. <laughs> in an attempt to catch the last express train to Hogwarts. <laughs> Rowling recently made light of the rash of injuries by saying, I don't know what all the fuss is about. Let's face it, none of these kids are going to cure cancer. <laughs> kids imitating the Harry Potter books, much to their dismay and sometimes injury. Next up, let's hear from Brian Babylon. In Eat, Pray, Love, Elizabeth Gilbert quits her job to travel the world eat great food, and sleep with Javier Bardem. She serves as an inspiration for millions of women and a few men all over the world, including, <laughs> including board insurance adjuster Nicole Buchanan from St. Louis, Missouri. Last year, Buchanan's friend Pamela Greer gave her the book to read. Said Greer, I didn't think she would take it so seriously. Nicole took it very seriously. She got divorced, quit her job, cashed in her 401k, and bought a one-way ticket to Leeds, England, where Travelocity was offering a deal. <laughs> Seven months later, Nicole found herself back in the States in bankruptcy court. Turns out she ate, prayed, and loved herself $120,000 into debt. <laughs> Quote, I gained 50 pounds, had three terrible relationships, and got an STD from a guy who said he was a monk. <laughs> I should have just stuck with Game of Thrones. <laughs> a woman tries to live out, eat, pray, love, and finds herself in deep trouble. 
Your last story of someone that should have closed that book before they got into trouble comes from Roxanne Roberts. It's all sexy, fun, and games until the London Fire Brigade shows up. Since 2010, officials have responded to more than 1,300 calls from people in compromising positions, many inspired by a certain erotic bestseller, E.L. James' Fifty Shades of Grey. (laughs) Quote, the number of incidents involving items like handcuffs seems to have gone up, said third officer Dave Brown in a press release. The brigade rescued one man who got, let's just say, entangled in a toaster. (laughs) Another who had an intimate encounter with a vacuum cleaner. The mishaps cost taxpayers nearly $580,000, not to mention seriously killing the mood of hundreds of ill-fated romantic evenings. (laughs) Quote, I'm sure most people will be 50 shades of red by the time our crews arrive to free them, said Brown. Here are your choices. Somebody, somewhere, got into trouble by reading a book, something we never recommend. Is it from Bobcat Goldthwait, kids all over the world getting into trouble as they try to live out the Harry Potter books? From Brian Babylon, a woman who tried to eat, pray, and love her own way to happiness, but ended up not getting anywhere close. Or from Roxanne Roberts, couples trying to live the 50 shades of gray way and getting stuck and having to be rescued. Which of these is the real story of a literary danger? Well, I'm thinking it's number three. Number three, that would be Roxanne's story about Fifty Shades of Grey. That's cool. Thank you. All right, then. Now, to bring you the correct answer, we spoke to someone involved in this real story. If you're going to use handcuffs or anything else involving love, keep the keys very, very close. That was Mark Hazelton of the London Fire Brigade reminding fans of Fifty Shades of Grey to always know where their handcuff keys are. Congratulations, you got it right. You earned a point for Roxanne Roberts. You've won our prize. Carl Castle will record the greeting on your home answering machine voicemail, whatever you have. Thank you so much for playing with us. And now the game where we like to take people who've done great things and force them to do one silly thing. There are plenty of small-town guys who stick around, get a boring job, but dream of writing the great American novel. And nothing ticks off those guys like the ones who actually pull it off. (laughs) Charles Fraser's first novel, Cold Mountain, was a huge international bestseller, made into a big film. We're delighted to have him here with us. Charles Fraser, welcome to Way Away Town Thank you. Thank you. Now... Is that story true? You were, you were born and raised here in Asheville, yeah. and you stayed here? You didn't go off after college? Um, went to Colorado for a while, but yeah. um, Asheville's home. Yeah. Mountains there are too high. Too yeah. high. You want the medium-sized mountains. Yeah. I, I quit uh, teaching at NC State uh, University and came to Asheville and worked on a book. Yeah. Great place for it. So tell me, tell me about your first published, uh, first published work. Um, what would that have been? A book about hiking, trekking in Peru. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Had you been there? <laughs> I, I wrote this proposal that said, I have never been to Peru, but I would like to write a book about going to Peru and hiking in the big mountains. And because I know nothing about it, yeah. I will be a perfect representative traveler. That's how I got and, this job. Yeah, yeah. And, you, and, they, you, and you use this pitch for hiking in Peru. They bought the idea. You yeah. could have done, like, <laughs> dating supermodels. Um, so, so tell me about Cold Mountain. This is, of course, your first novel that came out, what, now, like 2004, around there? Uh, a little earlier. A little earlier than that. Than that. Yeah. A huge international bestseller, made into a big film. Yeah. And this, this was like a story you had with you for a long time, the Civil War saga? Yeah, and a family story and a story set close to here, yeah. you know, it was, it was, uh, had a lot of my family history right. in it. So it's, it's yeah. true that you had a great, great uncle who left the battle lines of the Confederate side and came home to Nicole Kidman. D- yeah. 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 <laughs> Every person, man or woman, who sits down to write a first novel, there were about 4,000 of them here in this theater, 
dreams of what happened to you, that the novel being published, it being acclaimed, getting amazing reviews, winning the National Book Award, snapped up by Hollywood, was that your dream? Were you thinking there going, yeah, I'm thinking Jude Law for the lead role, chapter two. This is actually true. Okay. What I was hoping was it would get published and I would get a better teaching schedule than... than Really? Aim for the stars. <laughs> yeah. no, uh, you, know. you probably secretly dreamed that it would do well, but when did you actually realize that, that hey, this is going to actually be more than a standard mm. novel? Do that check. Well, <laughs> well yeah. Do yeah, yeah. that yeah, check. Yeah, check <laughs> Did you give the Did you give the earlier manuscript to anyone that that actually gave you either bad notes or told you that it was just so so? You know, I don't I don't like people to see what I'm working on until it's really finished. So I, I went, would go for years, and my wife wouldn't even see it. Really? She just had to take my word that I was. Really? Right? <laughs> You'd come down from your lonely cabin working in your novel, and she goes, "So, how's the novel coming along that I am working to support your writing?" And you'd be like, "Fine." What's yeah, for dinner? Pretty much, yeah. You, you've got to be one of the most famous authors in America after the success of, of Cold Mountain especially, but do you ever get recognized by the author photo? Do you ever, like, see somebody reading your book and just stand there and see if they recognize you by your <laughs> literary... literary? I, I have a couple of times. Really? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I have tapped people on the shoulder and said, uh, would you like me to sign that for you? And, and, how, did that, and how did that go down? Um... <laughs> Well, one was in Chicago, and yeah. I tapped this woman on the shoulder, said, would like me to sign that. And she looked at me like I was really crazy. And I said, turn the book over. And she looked at the picture and then looked at me. And, and so. I, I don't want to make it about me, but I'm about to. I was, <laughs> I was walking down a plane aisle, and I look, and there's this young man, and he's watching a movie I wrote and directed yeah. on the plane on his laptop. And I thought, I'm going to blow his mind. And I go, <laughs> I go, hi. And he goes, yeah. I go, well, I, I wrote and directed that movie. He goes, I paid for it. <laughs> I gotta ask you, did you get to, I mean, because, you know, obviously a a very successful Oscar winning movie was made uh, from your book, uh, coincidentally also called Cold Mountain. Did you, um, did you get to hang out with the big movie stars and be there in the set? A little bit. Yeah. Did Um, you enjoy that? Yeah, I would have enjoyed it more if it had been here in Western North Carolina. Um, It's... uh, it happened to be. It happened to be in Romania. Um, but, oh, that is. But that it was, is. I can't even believe. Yeah. That. Well, I, but well, it was I, still fun. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Romania is, of course, the Western North Carolina of Central Europe. <laughs> so you were in Romania, having an Englishman play your great great uncle, <laughs> uh, in love with an Australian, oh, yeah. pretending oh. to be in Western North Carolina, and you were like, "This is just what I imagined." Exactly. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, Asheville. Uh, As you say, Cold Mountain was set near here uh, in the Western Mountains of North Carolina. And uh, you grew up here. And and what is it that, I mean, it's it's a very hard to describe place, Asheville, for people who don't know it. How how would you describe it? Well, um, it's the coolest town in the South. Um, Also, I I, I can't help but notice, also the most modest. Yeah, humble, really, humble people here. really, it's, uh, really. It's cool because I've only been here during the humidity festival. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is it southern? Because it seems, you know, contradictory to some, to some ways. Well, it's not a uh, it's not a hillbilly mountain town. Never has been. Right. There's always been a real literary heritage here, a real arts heritage here. Uh, wonderful Art Deco architecture all around town. Well, it is a very literary town. We're in an auditorium named for named for Thomas Wolfe, uh, the great native son of Asheville. Yeah. And uh, yeah. uh, who uh, said you can't go home again and didn't. And um, <laughs> there seem to be writers everywhere around here. You, you can't throw a rock without hitting a writer. I mean, yeah. that must be a little irritating at times. <laughs> don't you? Don't, wouldn't it be nice to hang out with dumb people for a change? That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Oh, there, there's never a shortage of that anywhere. (laughs) 
Well, Charles Frazier, delighted to have you with us, and we've invited you here today to play a game we're calling... I'm listening, Seattle. Okay. You're a Frazier. You're not the Frazier. <laughs> that would be Frazier Crane, fictional radio psychiatrist from the TV show Frasier and Cheers. Get two out of three right of these three questions we will ask you about... Frazier, and you'll win our prize for one of our listeners, Carl's voice on their voicemail. Carl, who is author Charles Frazier playing for? He is playing for Ellen Knight of Asheville, North Carolina. All right. Welcome. Ready to do this? Ready to do this. The man who played, first, first question, the man who played Frazier Crane is more than just an actor, he's also an entrepreneur. Which of these was an actual business that Kelsey Grammer, the actor, started in 2010? A, an animal therapy clinic staffed entirely by cranes. B, the Channel Channel, an interactive TV network that helped kids learn to use tarot cards. Or C, Kelsey Grammer's Backwoods Biscuits and Gravy, a roadside diner chain meant to be a direct competitor to Cracker Barrel. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, B does sound more like reality in some warped way. So I'm going to go with B. You're going to go with B, the channel channel? Yeah. You're correct, correct. Very good. Grammer started the network in association with Kelsey Live, a self-described mini-Facebook made up entirely of Kelsey Grammer fans. Neither lasted longer than a year. Okay, your next question. Kelsey Grammer starred in the Broadway revival of the musical La Cage aux Faux. What did his male co-star say about Kelsey Grammer's kissing technique? A. I couldn't say. Kelsey always puts his hand between my mouth and his. B. He tastes like a musty humidor. Or C, he's one of the best I've ever had. It's like kissing John Wayne. I don't know. I'm going to go with B again. You're going to go with B again? He tastes like a musty humidor? Yeah. I'm afraid it was actually C. He liked it. The best I've ever had. <laughs> I don't know why kissing John Wayne would be like a superlative, but yeah. apparently it was. <laughs> All right, this is exciting. You have one more chance. If you get this right, you win. Here we go. Of course, the character Fraser Crane was a psychiatrist. Now, that had consequences, such as which of these? A, more than 60% of fake narcotic prescriptions in the 90s were signed with the name Dr. Fraser Crane. <laughs> B, the psychiatric referral group Counseling Seattle had to remind patients that Fraser Crane is not a real therapist. Or C, medical schools report Fraseritis, the tendency of psych residents to involuntarily talk like Fraser. B. Your final choice is B. And that would be correct. Very good. <laughs> Counseling Seattle is the name of the group, and they're very uh, they're unhappy with people constantly asking to speak to either Fraser or Niles Crane. They put out a statement that says, The Crane brothers are not positive role models for the profession. They are monumental egos. <laughs> Carl, how did Charles Fraser do in our quiz? He had two correct answers, Peter, so he wins for Ellen Knight. Well done. Charles Fraser, ladies and gentlemen, good job. Charles Fraser is the keynote speaker at this year's fundraiser for the Literacy Council of Buncombe County on August 23rd here in Asheville, North Carolina. Come on down. More information is at litcouncil.com. Charles Fraser, what a pleasure to talk to you. And meet Thank you. you. Thanks for being on our show. Thank you. Charles Fraser, ladies and gentlemen. From NPR and WBEZ Chicago, this is Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, the NPR News Quiz. I'm Carl Castle. We're playing this week with Brian Babylon, Roxanne Roberts, and Bobcat Goldthwait. And here again is your host at U.S. Cellular Center Asheville in North Carolina, Peter Sagal. Thank you, Carl. In just a minute... Carl spends four hours on hold with Rhyme Warner Cable Customer Service in our Listener Limerick Challenge. If you'd like to play, give us a call at one triple eight wait wait. That's one triple eight nine two four eight nine two four. Right now, panel some more questions for you from the week's news. Roxanne, historical vacation spots like Colonial Williamsburg give families a chance to live like people used to in a simpler time. 
without the distractions of modern technology, well now to attract more families, they're adding what? Oh, it's got to be an app or a Twitter account or um, something like that, right? Yeah, exactly right. They're adding modern technology. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you've been maybe you've been to places like this, right? You walk around, everybody's in period dress, making hats or milking donkeys or whatever people used to do, <laughs> talking to you like it's 1780. Now, though, they're adding iPad kiosks and dedicated apps. It makes sense, although last week some of the colonial people living there discovered one of their own with an iPad and burned her at the stake as a witch. <laughs> It does, you know, adding, adding this technology, even if it's, you know, anachronistic, it does make certain things easier. It used to be if you're at Colonial Williamsburg and you wanted to sext someone, you'd have to go down to the town Etcher to wait eight hours while he completed a dirty woodcut. Of an ankle. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Thou, thou dost Anthony Weiner sending an etching of his ankle to a young woman he does not know. Yeah. <laughs> Bobcat. Bobcat? Peter? Research Bobcat. <laughs> you crazy minx, what? <laughs> Researchers have, for the first time ever, inserted a what into a mouse. <laughs> I'm actually embarrassed on that one. Uh, they inserted a uh, GPS. No. That's good a um, ear. <laughs> Just to mess with it, no. I'll give you a hint, the mouse no longer has to tie a little string around its little finger. Uh, a, a memory chip? A memory. They inserted a memory into a mouse. This is true. And this is because mice were forgetting where they left their keys? Apparently. No, researchers at MIT working in a specialized field of science known as screwing around with animals... <laughs> inserted a, a, a false memory into the brain of a mouse so it remembers something wow. that never actually happened to it. Is the false memory a memory of some other mouse's behavior or, or does the mouse think it's like a bear? Yeah, but they, but they give it like a, 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 a monkey memory. Yeah. You know? no, I want a bear, I want a mouse like, you know, trying to knock salmon out of the air. That would be hilarious. No, it's a mouse breaking memory. Breaking into a tent. What they did was, is they, they were able through various incredibly technical things in the mouse's brain, convince it that something bad had happened to it in a particular container, even though nothing bad had ever happened to it in that container. Yeah, I know it's sad, isn't it? It's sad, but the, the idea is like they put the mouse in the container and it acted as if something bad had happened, even though it never happened. Did they ever think it was the mouse just didn't want to be in a container? <laughs> no, it, it is sad. You know, they didn't put in like a, like a memory of a nice summer day or the time it kicked the hell out of a cat. No. <laughs> memory of getting an electric Remember shock. Remember that time I won the Olympics? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, I would sell that to, I'm sorry, ladies. I'll that, well, you know what? I'll sell that to spouses. So if you have a husband who's kooky, if you have a wife that's kooky, just give him a memory. Of what? Of where I was last night. Home. <laughs> <laughs> where were you? You went home. There you are. <laughs> yep. Bobcat, according to a recent report from the American Society for Aesthetic Plastic Surgery, more and more middle-aged men are undergoing what procedure? I'm just going to go with uh, liposuction. No. <laughs> Breast augmentation? No. <laughs> Some men want to put a little juice in their caboose. Oh, they're having a, a butt implant? Butt implants, yes! <laughs> the demand for male posterior enhancement has more than doubled since 1997. The procedure involves sucking fat from your stomach and injecting it into your butt, which is the same way that's God done created with a, Eve, I that's think. That's done with a machine. Yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm going to contest my answer. Why? You were right. What because are you contesting? Part, uh, no, but when I said liposuction, part of the procedure is sucking the fat out. I just didn't get the part of shoving it back, it back in. in. Yeah. Yeah. You know what they should do? They should sell, sell custom-made butt implants with matching chairs so you can just lock in. You know? So what you're saying is somebody, some guy looks in the mirror and says... Do these pants make my butt look too small? Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. You know what you you don't need that surgery. All you need to do is wear some yoga pants. Really? 
Oh, man. Yeah. Yoga pants are Th like something from Hogwarts. They just magically... <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, I'll give you an idea how evolved I am as far as taking care of my body. I have no idea what yoga pants are. <laughs> I don't know what they look like. I could be wearing them right now. <laughs> okay. I think they have a, I think they hooked up with the military. This is my theory. Yeah. I think the yoga pants establishment got with some military folk that has some special polymer in the butt part. Or nanotechnology. I don't know. You never know. That gets all the meat from your thighs and everywhere and just puts it in a fully compact, nice package. Science! You bet. Coming up, it's lightning fill in the blank, but first it's the game where you have to listen for the rhyme. If you'd like to play on air, call or leave a message at one triple eight wait wait. That's one eight 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 nine two four eight nine two four, or click the contact us link on our website waitwait.npr.org. Hi, you're on wait wait. Don't tell me. Hi, this is Jen Fritz from Oak Park, Illinois. Hey, Oak Park is a lovely place, or so I've yeah. heard. And what do you do there? I work as a family medicine physician assistant, and I'm also a new mom. Oh, well, congratulations. Thank you. Jen, welcome to the show. Carl Castle is now going to perform for you three news-related limericks with the last word or phrase missing from each. If you can fill in that last word or phrase correctly, and two of the limericks will be a big winner. Ready to play? I'm ready. Here's your first limerick. In a land where class lines are not blurred, a feathery pet is preferred. If it's comfort you wish, get a dog, cat, or fish. But for status, one must have a... Bird. Yes, a bird! Forget tiny dogs or monkeys. The latest status pet for horrible people are birds. According to British socialite magazine Tatler, rich people are populating their front lawns with peacocks or Cornish game hens, much like the aristocrats of old or crazy people. <laughs> But you know what would be cool? Like, what? I saw this commercial guy had a, a falcon on one of those Game of Thrones yeah. things. That's pretty swagged out. Yeah. <laughs> if I saw a guy with, like, a falcon just standing there at a bar or something, like, man, you're going in a good direction. <laughs> I would think, I like where you're headed. Falconry. He would be your wingman. Yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. Here is your next limerick. At lunch, I just stare at my phone because eye contact turns me to stone. It's a large dining hall, but it's private for all. With dividers, we all eat. Alone. Alone, yes. Very good. Nobody likes to eat alone, and certainly you don't want to be seen eating alone, so rather than help people make friends, Kyoto University has installed so-called lonely seats in the cafeteria. The dining tables have special dividers to hide your tears as you cry into your sandwich at lunch. Because instead of the shame of eating alone, you can have the pride of eating at something called a lonely seat. <laughs> All right, here is your last limerick. I like meat, but I don't condone murder. So I take DNA sampling further. Once this Petri dish fills, I'll go straight to the grill. I am serving my own test tube. Um, platter? Not platter, no. Although that would be tasty. <laughs> Let's try it again. Let's hear it one more time, Carl, yeah, if you don't yeah. mind, and we'll get the rhyme. Here we go. I like meat, but I don't condone murder. So I take DNA sampling further. Once this Petri dish fills, I'll go straight to the grill. I am serving my own test tube. Not platter. No. Um, what rhymes with further? Further? And, and murder. Right, one last guess. Murder. What do you think? Murder. Further. How about... What do you put on the grill, lady? <laughs> <laughs> what? Frankfurter? No. Oh, no. You're close. I'll give it to you. You've already won. It's burger. Burger. first ever lab-grown hamburger was served in London. The burger cost nearly $400,000 to make, which seems like a lot, but that includes fries, so. <laughs> Carl, how did Jen do on our quiz? Jen, you did fine. You had two <laughs> correct answers, so I'll be doing the message on your home answering machine. Well Thank done. You. Thank you. Thank you for playing, Jen. Thank you.
Now on to our final game, lightning fill-in-the-blank. Each of our players will have 60 seconds in which to answer as many fill-in-the-blank questions as he or she can. Each correct answer is worth two points. Carl, can you give us the scores? We have a three-way tie, Peter. Brian, Roxanne, and Bobcat all have three points each. Oh, my gosh. Brian, randomly, we've decided you're going to go first. The clock will start when I begin your first question, fill in the blank. Saying it is unconstitutional, a judge in New York struck down Mayor Bloomberg's plan to ban large blank. Soda drinks. Right. A mystery illness that has sickened more than 400 people in 15 states was linked to bagged blank this week. Lettuce. Yes. Because of its nuclear program, the House passed a bill Wednesday tightening sanctions against blank. Iran. Right. College students and parents bring the decide of relief this week as Congress finally approved a plan on blank. Student loan. Yes. A Chinese man was caught when he attempted to sneak his pet turtle past airport security by blanking. Drinking by hiding it in a hamburger. Russian internet users expressed skepticism after government news agencies released photos of blank posing with a giant fish he caught. Uh, Putin. Of course. ABC News reported that the issue of Blank magazine with the Boston bomber in the cover sold double what the average issue does. Uh, Rolling Stone. Right. India's military learned two Chinese spy drones they'd been monitoring in their airspace for six months were actually blank. Uh, we're actually Indian spy drones. No, we're the, actually the planets Jupiter and Venus. <laughs> Indian officials are very relieved, primarily because now they can concentrate on a more serious matter, the huge menacing fireball that India's enemies have been launching at it every single morning. <laughs> Carl, how did Brian do in our quiz? Brian had six correct answers for 12 more points. He now has 15 points, and he has the lead. Well done. Nice round, Brian. All right. Bobcat Goldthwait, you're up next. Fill in the blank. Is it, uh, do I really have to go? Yes, <laughs> pretty much. There's no way I'm going to get 12. Well, we enjoy watching you squirm. Here yeah, I know. All right, all right. Fill in the blank, Bobcat. After her profanity-laced rant against a former intern was published, the spokeswoman for New York mayoral candidate blank apologized. Uh, Wiener? Anthony Wiener, that's right. Because he wasn't required to take sexual harassment training, the embattled mayor of blank says the city should pay his legal bills. Oh, uh, San Diego. Right. After photographs of the new royal baby appeared, the blank that the baby was wearing immediately sold out of stores. Oh, um... <laughs> Dean <Dating and> Grin? <laughs> <laughs> The onesie. The onesie? The blanket he was wearing. Oh. American Idol judge Blank announced Wednesday that he and his friend's wife are expecting a baby. Well, um, I don't know that show anymore. It's, uh, should I just tell you, it's Simon Cowell. Former, baby. former judge. Former judge, true. Oh. The airline EasyJet apologized after sending out an alert telling passengers their flight was blank. Hijacked? No. Delayed for 86 years. <laughs> Passengers received an email saying, We are writing to inform you that your flight will depart at 11 a.m. local time on July 29th, 2099. <laughs> Passengers were naturally frustrated by the change. Many said they'd just stay at the gate because with the security lines and traffic, if they tried to go home, they'd just have to turn right around and come back. Carl, how did Bobcat do in our quiz? Really uh, well. Really well. <laughs> really well. well, well. Well, Bobcat had two correct answers for four more points. He now has seven points, but Brian still has the lead with 15. All right. How many then, how many then does Roxanne need to win? Six to tie, seven to win outright. Here we go, Roxanne. This is for the game. Fill in the blank. On Tuesday, President Obama revealed what he's described as a grand bargain to create middle class blank. Um, corporate tax cut deal. I'm going to give it to you because we said jobs, but that's right. <laughs> a new government report says that misconduct by blank agents, such as stealing from suitcases and sleeping in the job, is up 26%. TSA. Yes. After pleading guilty, the man who kidnapped three women in blank was sentenced to life plus 1,000 years. The three women in Cleveland. Yes. On Thursday, Italy's highest court upheld former Prime Minister Blank's conviction for tax fraud. Berlusconi. Right. Tourists in France are being warned to be careful after a woman and her poodle were attacked by a blank. American tourist. <laughs> Gang of cats. On Thursday, the Senate confirmed Samantha Power to replace Susan Rice as the next blank. UN ambassador. Yes. French authorities increased border security in an attempt to find a robber who stole $136 million in blank from a hotel on the in, French Riviera. In diamonds. Yes. Saying it was delinquent in paying its bills, an electric company in New Zealand sent a threatening letter to blank. Um, to 
the government. To a lamppost. <laughs> The letter demanded that the lamp post call Meridian Energy within seven days and provide them with its customer details or its electricity would be shut off. And when the neighbor who accidentally got the lamp post mail called to explain the situation, the company refused to budge. Meridian Energy finally apologized and said it will not harass the lamp post again, but also said that it doesn't mean the deadbeat traffic light on 6th Street is off the hook. Carol, did Roxanne do well enough to win? I bet she hopes she did. She did well enough to tie. She had six correct answers. So, with 12 points, Roxanne Roberts and Brian Double on a tie for first place. Well done! It counts. It counts. It counts. In just a minute, we're going to ask our panelists what Yankee star Alex Rodriguez will do after baseball. But first, let me tell you that support for NPR comes from NPR stations and the National Association of Realtors, an advocate for home ownership. More at houselogic.com slash homeownership. Chevrolet, maker of the Volt with electric technology to get there and fuel to go farther. Details at chevyvolt.com. Angie's List, providing reviews of local roofers, painters, landscapers, and plumbers to keep the consumer informed. More at angieslist.com. And eSurance, an all-state company, offering all online and mobile car insurance tools to guide customers from quote to claim. More at eSurance.com. Wait, wait, don't tell me is a production of NPR and WBEZ Chicago in association with the Urgent Haircut Productions, Doug Berman, Benevolent Overlord. Special thanks this week to Stuart Sound and to Alsace Wallentine at Malaprop's Bookstore Cafe in Asheville, the finest independent bookstore cafe in these parts. B.J. Litterman composed our theme. Our program is produced by Eva Walchover and Emily Ecton. Technical direction is from Lorna White. Our production coordinator is Popcan Newhouse. Our senior producer is Neon Ian Chillag. The executive producer, wait, wait, don't tell me, is Mr. Michael Danforth. Now, panel, what will A-Rod do next? Brian Babylon. A-Rod will have a new reality show about his new chain of gyms called A-Roids, where the gym equipment <laughs> makes you feel younger than you really are. Roxanne Roberts. In an effort to raise the moral bar of the campaign, A-Rod will announce he's running for mayor of New York. <laughs> and Bobcat Goldway. Um, surprising, uh, he's going to be uh, the new judge on uh, American Idol. <laughs> <laughs> well, if A-Rod does any of that panel, we'll ask you about it on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Thank Me. Thank you, Carol Castle. Thanks to the crew at the U.S. Cellular Center, Asheville. Thanks to Barbara Sayer and Michelle Keenan at WCQS. Thanks to all of you for listening. You're fabulous. I am Peter Sagal, and we will see you next week. This is NPR.